This is the Build Wealth Canada podcast, episode number 101. Welcome to the Build Wealth Canada podcast, where it's all about becoming debt-free, accelerating your wealth, and taking control of your money. Now, here's your host, Cornell Schreiber. Hey, it's Cornell, and welcome to the Build Wealth Canada show. It is RRSP season here in Canada, and remember that March 1st is the deadline for contributing to an RRSP and have a count towards your 2022 tax year. Also, while we're on the subject, remember that your TFSA contribution room grows every year. And for the 2023 calendar year, you now have an extra $6,500 that you and your partner can contribute each. So $13,000 total if you both max it out. And last year, the limit was actually $6,000 per person. So the government did increase that by $500 per person for this year. I find that these are things that are easy to forget as life gets busy, but I always have reminders set up for these things as well. And I recommend you do too, especially in the case of the TFSA, as it's always nice to put in the effort to max that out so that you can get that tax-free growth on that new money invested all year long. Since it's RRSP season and tax season is coming up, I thought it would be worthwhile to have another successful Canadian financial planner on the show so that we can get a good second opinion on things like how much do you need to be financially independent and have the option of retiring? What are some of the sustainable withdrawal strategies that you can use when you're ready to start living off your portfolio? And what's the process and calculations that should be done annually to ensure that you are withdrawing a sustainable amount from your portfolio? And since our guest today, John Callows, has been in the financial planning industry for decades at this point, I also ask him if he's noticed certain patterns when it comes to clients that are successful both financially and in life versus those that are not. And this way we can pick some lessons learned from others, apply them to our own lives, and avoid some completely avoidable mistakes that others have had to endure before us. Now, before we get into the interview, I wanted to invite you to a free webinar and Q&A session that I'll be doing with the actual creator of the TFSA. He's the former chief of staff for the Minister of Finance in Canada, and his name is Kevin McCarthy. If you've ever had TFSA or RRSP-related questions or would just like to ask the creator of the TFSA your questions, you can do so at this webinar. I'll be there too, obviously. And so after Kevin goes through his educational presentation where he goes over the RSP and TFSA fundamentals, as well as the tax deductions and tax credits available to us Canadians, we'll then have a live Q&A with him and I, so you can ask him or me your questions when it comes to things like personal finance, investing, financial independence, retirement, early retirement, living off your investments, etc. So the session, it's on February the 23rd, 2023, and it will be recorded. So even if you can't make it live, you can still sign up to be emailed the replay once it's released. Also, Kevin has informed me that anyone attending live will receive a downloadable version of him and his team's proprietary income tax and RSP tax savings calculator. So that's a nice bonus to get you involved as well. And that link to sign up for free is over at buildwealthcanada.ca slash webinar. That's buildwealthcanada.ca slash webinar. I look forward to seeing you and interacting with you there. And now let's get into the interview. All right, John, welcome back. Nice to be here, Cornell. It's been a little over a year, I think. For sure. Yeah, it's been a while. It's nice when you come on here and I get to pick your brain. You've got quite a few decades of experience at this point. How long have you been doing financial planning now? I can't remember. I've been a certified financial planner since 1998. Okay. Which is when the program was launched here in Quebec. The certified financial planners. And so, yeah, I was working at the bank. And before 98, I'll say from 92 to 98, I was an investment advisor, but not a certified financial planner. And once that uh, certificate came to be, then I sort of jumped all over it. Here we are 24 years later. Nice. And so you said you're based in Quebec, but you have clients from all over Canada at this point, right? As a matter of fact, I would tell you 90% of my clients are outside of Quebec, literally from the Yukon to Newfoundland, like literally in every province in between. So yeah, this new era of how we're able to do financial planning has really opened the entire country. So that's pretty good. That's one thing I love about 
the age we live in now is where you're no longer restricted to the quality you get by proximity. It used to be that, oh, it has to be someone local because it just has to Correct. work with. And now it's like, okay, it doesn't matter where they are in Canada. We're looking for who's the highest quality person. And that's the decision, right? And it doesn't matter whether they're in Toronto or Halifax or Vancouver. That is no longer... I mean, it's still nice to see someone in person, obviously. Certainly. I get these questions from listeners of the show at times saying, hey, do you know anyone in Vancouver because they're from Vancouver or anyone in Toronto? And I kind of pause and say, well, are you sure you want that to be one of your main decision criteria? Because I know it's a nice to have, I agree, but isn't it wiser to try to get the best person that you can, expert that you know has a really good track record, shouldn't that be the criteria? And it's like if that person is at the other end of Canada, why would you care? Don't you want save thousands in taxes and investment optimization instead at the expense of, oh, I have to go on a Zoom call instead of face-to-face? That's right. I hear you. And you mentioned the Zoom call and everything that I do with my clients, They, I put things up on my screen and they're able to see it, right? Because we do the, the exactly. camera sharing. And so nothing is missed. And it's quite the convenience, right? But historically, it's been, you know, my radius for clients is 50 miles, for example, 50 kilometers. And that's how everybody was raised with that type of model, right? And I'm, I was the first one that I know of that went cross country and my colleagues at the office saw that it was successful, they're doing the same thing now, which is quite interesting, right? So it really is, maybe I'm not the pioneer, maybe there was someone before me, but man, I never saw anyone do it the way we've been doing it for, or the way I've been doing it for the past seven years. I was doing this before the pandemic, right? So with the pandemic, people became more comfortable with technology, but I was doing it before and there was still a lot of interest People just want quality right now. And the truth is, Cornell, everyone is jaded, okay? Everyone, when we think about financial planning or investment advisors and stuff like that, the first thing that comes to people's mind is fees and maybe not the best service. Service is actually the biggest issue. And so it's important to find somebody that you're comfortable with that has a track record. It's a good idea to ask for, if I have a client that's coming to me, I'll tell them straight up, you should speak to some of my my other clients across the country, just to get a feel of how things are doing it online. So I encourage these things. And I think it's the best way to do things right now. For sure. I like it as well now with the whole digital age, how you can actually record the meetings as well. I know I found that to be valuable. Like I know when my wife and I hit our financial independence number, you were one of the financial planners who that I worked with to just double check all my numbers and sort of have an independent second yeah. opinion. Okay. That, Cornell do the math right, <laughs> or did I mess it up? And I actually should not hand in my resignation yet, right? So yeah, 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 I remember yeah, yeah. That <laughs> That's hilarious. You know what? That was a long time ago. It and was. I'll say it on the show. Let's get together again to review everything if you'd like. Anytime. Sure. Right. That's, so that that's important great. also, right? It's a plan is not a plan, and here you go, follow it, and that's it. It evolves, obviously. Very much so. It evolves with your needs. It evolves with the markets. It evolves with you know interest rate. So it's important to do something and then you know follow up on it. For sure. Not everybody needs an annual follow up. Okay, Let's, and I have certain clients where the way we do things is we do a year's worth of planning, and then if we think it's important to continue into the future, there's a renewal fee, right? And so. When I see, though, that clients won't really benefit, I'll let them know. Example, Mr. and Mrs. that have their house and the mortgage, no children. They're going to get a nice pension from work, and they're saving $3,000 a year, for example. If life doesn't change for them, and they're continuing in their job, and they're continuing you know, where they are in their home, and there's no other big projects, then really, there's maybe not a reason to review things on an annual basis. So everything depends on circumstances. And so I'll say it's important to review, but it's not necessary all the time, Mm -hmm. or at least for everybody, I'll say. But most people do need to follow up and make sure things are still on track. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And yeah, we're going to get right into the content here and talk about financial planning and how to make sure you actually have enough to retire and how to make sure you don't run out. Those are some of the big things we're going to be covering today. 
But just as a little to preface all that, in case somebody, you've been on the show multiple times at this point, but just in case somebody is hearing you for the first time, can you briefly tell us a little bit more? You already mentioned a bit, but maybe if there's anything you want to add about your experience and your area of expertise. So area of expertise is retirement planning. I have a soft spot for business owners and retirement planning. There's lots of different things. Financial planning is different for business owners. So I really enjoy working with business owners. Retirement planning for people that are close to retirement. These are what I call these days the critical situation for clients when we're five years from retirement, the markets are dropping. And man, is my still on the right track? I have clients that are telling me, that told me this year, that they were planning on retiring and they're concerned now. And they should be because, especially with interest rates, the way we were planning for retirement over the past 40 years has changed because we don't have that asset now that we had in the past being bonds that'll supplement, or I should say that'll cover any negative returns from the markets. If you look at the markets over the past 40 years, whenever we've had a down market, we've pretty much captured all the loss from bonds. And so I can show you a screen that shows you the returns of the markets and the returns of a balanced portfolio over the years. And the bonds always sort of held up. And as a matter of fact, they did well when the markets were going down. Last year, we saw the bond market go down and the stock market go down. That hasn't happened at least in 40 years, not in my experience, at least. And so things are a little different now. And there's a couple of new messages that I've been telling my clients that has evolved due to interest rates being at zero and now all of a sudden shooting up. Yeah. It is very interesting because I remember, I mean, I've read just about every book I could get my hands on over the years when on you know financial planning and in Canada specifically, things of that nature. And I would say the vast, vast majority, you know, we'll talk about bonds and how, okay, these are the this nice safe thing. And then you look at what happened recently, present time. And I mean, people that bought bonds, I mean, they were down over 10% at one point in the very like recent 15. past. Yeah. To me, it, as soon as it crossed that 10% line of a drop, that made me scratch my head a bit because mm. here we are, You know, if you've been reading this book, these books, you're trying to be diligent with all these things that you're told, okay, bonds is the safety portion of your portfolio. This is what's mm. there. In my brain, a 10% drop or more in a year, like that doesn't scream safe to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I hear you about us having to reevaluate how things are are different. And Correct. we can't just go with this default. Or if we do, like it's kind of like you have to know the, the pros and cons of what you're getting into. And I yeah. do worry that there were many people who were told this story about how safe and non-volatile bonds are, and then their bond portfolio drops by over 10%. And it's like, well, hold on. That's not what I've been told. That's not what I signed up for yeah. when I bought these bonds. And so I hear yeah. you. It's a very interesting challenge with not clear-cut solution where at, just do answer X and that's always the best answer. Right. And it's such a situational thing depending on what how people navigate that. And so what's to be done? What if interest rates continue going up and we have another negative returns in markets? That's two years of a balanced portfolio earning negative returns. Retirement plans are really hurting if that scenario occurs. So what are the alternatives? And this is what I'll be talking about today. It's not only bonds. There are other instruments that are available that are more accessible now. And these are the types of things that I'm pretty sure we're going to be talking about uh, during our conversation. Mm -hmm. So I have a, quite a few interesting things to bring up. Sounds good. In Sounds today's good. podcast, yeah. Awesome. Yes. So let's get into it. And then just one little caveat as well is we do have a page that we created for you for anybody that wants to to speak with you as well. So I'll mention that really briefly. It's just buildwealthcanada.ca slash John. So if you go there, John, you do like free consult for, for anybody that is considering working with you as like a no obligation type thing. Right. So I just wanted to point that as a resource. So if someone is looking for a financial planner, and I mean, you're probably interviewing several different ones and you're doing your research, your due diligence before you settle on someone with John, you know, if, if you like what he has to say, if you think he might be a good fit, that is a page that we've had on the site for, for years now for anybody that can go in there, sign up, that's a bulletin listener, and you can get a free consult with John just to see if you're a good fit, that kind of thing. So it's just buildwealthcanada.ca slash John for anybody interested. And I'll say not only if you're looking, if you have questions, you know, like it's not necessarily only for people that are looking for a financial planner. 
Okay, but if there's awesome. any questions, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, and I've done that often. People have called me. I just have a couple of questions and this and that. That's great. And so let's call it a service like that also. And if a client needs help, then by all means. But I'll just make clear that if, if it's just for general question or knowledge or whatever, then by all means, I'll take that. That's wonderful. I appreciate you offering yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. That's great. Because yeah, I get too many questions and now it's to the point where I, I just, I can't answer one-on-one questions <laughs> via email anymore. And as someone like is a student of the course and obviously like they paid money. So I do answer those, right? But for like just right. general questions, I can't really, there's just too many. <laughs> and so I appreciate you throwing that out there that yeah, if someone has a specific question, you're willing to take the call and then chat with them. So that's great. So I, I appreciate that. And now a quick message from one of our sponsors. All right, I want to give a big shout out to Passive for sponsoring this episode. They are free to use and are literally the number one tool that I consistently use to manage all my investments. If you've been investing for any period of time, you know how important rebalancing your portfolio is as that's what allows you to consistently buy low and sell high with your investments as well as ensure that you aren't taking on any additional unnecessary risk. Now, as critical as rebalancing your portfolio is, it's actually a manual and annoying labor-intensive process as to do it correctly, you have to log into each of your household's investment accounts and do manual data entry on a spreadsheet to figure out how much to buy of each investment every single time that you have money to invest. And there's always the chance that you make a mistake and miscalculate something when doing it yourself on a spreadsheet. So these days, when I have money to invest, I simply log into Passive, I immediately see what I'm holding too much and too little of in my portfolio, and Passive automatically calculates how much I need to buy of each ETF to get me back to my target across all of my household's accounts. Then in a couple clicks, I can have Passive buy the investments that I'm holding too little of across all my and my wife's accounts without me having to log in and out of each account to manually do the trades myself. I'm also able to see how my entire household's investment portfolio is doing across all our accounts in just a mouse click instead of manually having to add everything up across all my accounts. So they have a free account that you can use to try them out. And if you are a Quest Trade user like me, you also get their premium account for free. So it's a complete no brainer. And I've personally been using them for years at this point. So I can definitely vouch for them as they have literally become my number one favorite tool for managing my investments. They saved me many any dozens of hours when I'm managing and optimizing my portfolio. So definitely check them out. They are a fantastic Canadian company and you can get your free account by going to buildwealthcanada.ca slash free. Again, that's buildwealthcanada.ca slash free. And now back to the show. So now let's kick things off for someone is trying to determine how much they need to be financially independent and have the option of retiring what is the process that should be undertaken to figure this out? Good question. And what typically occurs in the industry is you'll have an advisor, a financial planner, sit down with a client and say, well, okay, let's, how much do you think you need for retirement? And they'll say, and they may say a number, many will say, I don't know. But what we've done in the industry in the past is we've worked from a point of all right, let's assume, or let's say you need $60,000 a year or seven, whatever. Making that type of assumption, I think, is a little off. Nobody knows how much money they're going to need 30 years from now when they retire. It'll, it'll depend on inflation. It'll depend on whatever their circumstances are at that point. So what I like to do when I'm sitting down with a client is to, not to ask how much do you think you need, but to say, based on what you're doing right now, based on how much money you have right now, based on what savings we can assume you can make, this is where you're headed for. Meaning, in those circumstances, this is your attainable retirement income. And when I work on the software, it'll show me, all right, based on all of these things, this individual looks like they can have up to $60,000 in retirement money after taxes, which includes the Canada Pension Plan, old age security, and all that stuff. So the point that I'm, I want to make clear is that difficult to determine how much you need. This is what I've sort of discovered working with clients who were 10 years before retirement, and now they're 10 years after retirement. And what we were talking about 20 years ago is not the same thing as what we're talking about today. So I like to show people, this is where you're headed towards if you continue doing what you're doing. And usually the response will be, wow, that's more than I thought. Great. Or 
yikes, you know, we got work to do or, you know, forget about 55. <laughs> it's not going to happen. And so that's the way I like doing things and making sure that we show a number and we'll get a good idea if that's not enough or too much or too little. That's how I go about doing things at the beginning of financial planning, let's say with a client. I like that. That's different approach than what I hear from others in, in terms yeah. of let's figure yeah. out your trajectory. And if you just keep doing what you're doing, here's kind of the projected result. And then the conversation becomes, are you happy with that? Are you not? Maybe this means you're retiring way later than you thought. And so you're not okay. Yeah. And then I Correct. imagine that leads to the conversations of, okay, what levers can we pull? What lifestyle things can we change so that we're on the right trajectory to where we right. want to be? So yeah, I like that. That's a very interesting, different approach, I think, than what other that I've seen others do. Very interesting. Correct. Now, if somebody is one or two years from retirement, then I'll tell them, let's go over your statements, your bank account and your credit card, and let's determine, or they can do it on their own, determine all of your expenses and see which ones will be there when I retire and which ones won't. Theoretically, the mortgage is not going to be there. Theoretically, the children are gone, quote unquote, right? And so these... It gets a little easier, obviously, to determine how much money you'll need when you're one or two years away. But these are the points that we need to look at when it comes to proper retirement planning. Mm -hmm. And so this is the exercises we go through with my clients when we're looking at retirement planning. And what are some of the sustainable withdrawal strategies that you recommend for those looking to live off their portfolio? Like most of the listeners of the show have heard of the 4% rule. There's Mm -hmm. variable percentage withdrawal methods. There's, There's Literally, I believe dozens at this point of different sort of yeah. strategies. Are there certain ones that you like, favor? I mean, I'm sure it depends on the client to client, depending on their preferences, but yeah. are there some that you have found to hold up pretty well? Yep. I'll tell you, I'm not a big fan of rules of thumb. Okay. So 4% rule, it's very easy to understand and to implement stuff like that. But you know what? If we have three negative years in a row, Throw out the 4% rule, throw out everything because you're in trouble if we have consecutive years of negative returns and the only revenue source that you have is your investments. I'll bring something up that that I'll be able to show you, Cornell. I mean, people won't be able to see it, but we'll describe it in a proper way. But something that that I've never heard, I shouldn't say never, rarely have I heard financial planners talk about this particular risk which I think is the most important risk or the riskiest is what's called sequence of returns risk. So what does that mean? I might as well bring it up now. If you give me a second. Sure. And yeah, for everybody listening, just an audio form, John and I will do our best to describe what we're seeing so that you don't actually have to see it visually. We'll have this on YouTube in the future as well, but just, yeah, (laughs) we will describe. (laughs) All right. So this is what we call sequencing of returns risk. And it's something that, as I mentioned before, not a lot of people are talking about. But this example will really give you an idea of what the risk is when we only have our investments and maybe a little bit of other guaranteed income coming in. But when we're depending on our investments to cover us for retirement, and then there's this risk, which is something. And so let's go ahead and I'll explain to you. I'm showing a couple of clients now, okay? John and Susan. John is ready to retire. This is what we're, we're looking at now, people. He has amassed half a million dollars of liquid investments to support his retirement in a balanced portfolio, 60 stocks, 40% bonds. And John will need $25,000 a year from this money with inflation at 3%. Now, Luck would have it, John experiences three initial years of negative portfolio returns, but the portfolio averages over the next 25 years, 8%, right? So here's a sequence of returns for the next 25 years. And what happens in John's situation is that there's three negative years at the beginning of retirement, okay? And so this will show you now what happens to John's money. First year, we have a negative 10% return. So the money goes down in value, and then we're withdrawing money as well to live. And the second year, the portfolio goes down by 13%. So money's going down again, and we're drawing money to live. Now we're in in somewhat of a mess. And then a third year comes along with another negative return. What happens to John's portfolio is by the time he's reached age 83, there's no more money left. He's run out of money. And over the lifetime of this plan... He's only withdrawn about $600,000. 
So again, money runs out at age 83 if we have poor returns at the beginning of retirement. And as a matter of fact, it's not only the beginning of retirement, but any part of your retirement where we may have several years of negative returns, which has happened, then we really, we're going to be behind the black ball. And so this is what's called sequence of returns risk. Now, the second individual, Susan, has the same exact portfolio, except the sequence of the returns has changed. So what I've done is, as you can see, Cornell, the returns over all the years for John, what I've done is I flipped this upside down. And so Susan starts their retirement, let's call it, with good years of return. So positive returns. But she has the same type of the same portfolio, which earns 8%, but didn't have these poor years at the beginning. She never runs out of money. And as a matter of fact, at age 90, she's left with $1.6 million. So what a difference from running out of money by age 83 and $1.6 million at the age of 90. Why? Because good years came early in her retirement. And the poor years came later in life. And so good years means your money's growing and you're withdrawing. So you're not depleting your capital the way you were in the first situation. This is what's called sequence of returns risk. And so we have two or three bad years. It can really derail plans. And so this is the biggest danger as far as I'm concerned. And I'll tell you what we can do about that danger. I like to say... It's important to set up several buckets of retirement money that you can have access to during retirement. You need to have one or two more buckets. So when the markets go down in value, instead of taking out money from the markets, well, then you have these other two buckets, two or three different buckets that you have access to where your money is not going down. So what are those buckets? One of them is easy to understand, a bank account. And interest rates are higher today, so we can find ourselves with a bank account earning 4%. So I'd have some money in there socked away. So when I do have some bad years, I have that source of money that I can get my retirement money. And when we have good years, shave a little bit of money off your capital and put it in that bucket. So again, we can have more money in the future. That's just one bucket. There are other buckets that are available where your investment, where your money will grow there's no negative return, and you have access to that money income you want. So the point I want to make here is that there are several buckets that are available to anyone that we can use. So when we have poor years in the markets, we can go get money for our retirement from those buckets. So that's the biggest for me right now, after this year too, after seeing what happened in 2001, 2002, seeing what happened in the late 90s as well, 2008, 2009, I've gone through all these periods. And so I saw a lot of people with a portfolio where they had to go back to work because poor years and we're withdrawing money. They don't have a pension plan. They haven't reached a Canada pension plan and old age security yet. So depending on their money, and that's where things get dangerous. Can you speak a bit more to the other buckets that exist and how much should we have in each bucket? I realize as well that this can vary from person to person because some people have a higher risk tolerance, some have a lower risk tolerance. Correct. Some need to have that extra safety because maybe they have certain family obligations or expenses. Maybe they have some medical condition that they really need that extra money there in a safe spot. So I realize this is not one perfect answer for every situation, but just in terms of general guidelines, can you speak to what some of those buckets are? And as a general rule, how big are they? Do you recommend people make them as a starting point? And then I imagine mm -hmm. from there, you might tweak them a little bit depending on the particular situation. Right. So the first one I mentioned is your bank account, right? So it's earning three, 4% right now. So that's that's the easiest way to set up a bucket, let's say. But when interest rates go back, if interest rates go back down to you know one, one and a half, two, maybe it's not the best from a rate of return point of view, right? But that's one dependable bucket, let's say. Another one that many people haven't heard of, that pension plans that the Canada Pension Plan, uh, the Ontario Teachers Plan use is what's called alternative investments. That is a type of investment that most of the huge majority of people don't have or never had access to because to have these what's called alternative investments, you needed millions of dollars. 
But now there are lots of, I won't say lots, there are a few firms that have reduced their minimums for alternative investments. And so they're more accessible to you and I, let's say, than they were five, 10 years ago. And so what are alternative investments? I'll tell you, there's several. One is private equity instead of the equity markets. So you're not participating in stock market, but you're participating in private equity, private deals that are not trading on the stock markets. There is infrastructure. So windmills, for example, the highways, look at the Ontario, I think it's the 407 in Toronto, where that's a private highway, that's infrastructure, that's an alternative investment. Private lending, so not the bond market, but companies that are not on the market, but they need $50 million because they have a project in China, well, they got to get financing from somewhere. So there's what we call private financing. These are the types of investments that are available and what pension plans use that are not available to most people. But we do have access to them now. And I work with several companies that, or at least I know several companies that offer these alternative investments. So that's another bucket, alternative investments. And I'll I'll mention to people, just Google that term and you'll get some answers as to what these are. And like I said, the Canada Pension Plan, 70% of the assets in the Canada Pension Plan right now are in alternative investment. So all the big bucks have gone there in the past. Why? The volatility is minimal. It's not nearly as volatile as the stock market. And the returns have been giving stock market returns, typical stock market returns, but with a heck of a lot lower volatility. So that's a great type of investments to have if you need money from your investments. If you're 30 something, ETFs all the way, equity all the way, if you can handle the minus 30s you know that we occasionally get. So that's fine. When we're getting close to retirement, maybe five years away from retirement and later than that, that's when we have to start saying we need to find some investments or we need to make our portfolio be a lot less volatile to avoid the sequencing of returns risk that I mentioned before. So that's another bucket. There's another bucket also available through the insurance industry. And so they have some ideas or concepts that are for wealth building purposes, not for insurance purposes, but for wealth building purposes where you have tax-free money Basically, it's like a TFS. In a sense, it's like a TFSA where money grows in that environment in a tax-free in a tax-free way, and the returns are actually never negative. And so that's a little bit more of a conversation to explain properly. But this is again something that is available in the industry. Many people are not aware of, and it's just another. I call that even a more exotic bank account because the value never goes down, and you always have access to your money. And so when I have clients, I've had discussions with clients this year where we're saying, okay, how much money do we need in 2023? Well, we need X amount. Well, where are we going to get it? Bonds and stocks went down, you know, 15, 20%. We're not going to go get our money there. So we have this other bucket where we're saying this bucket always goes up when we're having negative returns. Let's take money from there. So we're not going to touch our money when there's negative returns. So bank account, alternative investments. And I'll say again, some strategies from the insurance industry that are done for wealth building purposes that are available as well. And then of course, the more typical like, you know, equities, bonds, that goes without saying, but if you're talking about sort of the more, I guess, less apart from those two, (laughs) which is what are some of the other ones for like, let's say somebody. So I hear you, what you're saying about how there are these other options, like there's certain insurance products that you're talking about. There's the annuities as well from the insurance side. That may or may not be appropriate for people, right? So this is the evaluation that I'm able to do to determine if it's appropriate or not. For sure. And now a quick message from one of our sponsors. There are so many opinions on how to invest your money today, but it can be hard to find credible voices to rely on in the world of finance and investing. One resource that I turn to every week is the ETF Market Insights YouTube channel led by today's episode sponsor, BMO ETFs. Market Insights brings in industry experts, and the weekly episodes cover the hottest themes like inflation, infrastructure, healthcare, and more. Tuning in helps me stay up to date on what's happening so I can be a smarter investor, and you can also submit your own ETF questions to be answered on the show. So do yourself a favor and subscribe on YouTube to ETF Market Insights or visit 
etfmarketinsights.com so you can be notified when future episodes go live. And now back to the show. Let's say somebody, this is kind of, I guess what I do is I like to keep things you know, really, really simple and I'm very yep. much like ETF equity investor, that kind of thing. But I'm all, you know, with two kids and no wife, I do like having a little bit of sort of cash in there, earning some interest just you know for sort of peace of mind and for when things right. inevitably come up. If someone is like in my situation where they're okay with a higher volatility, mm-hmm. they're already in retirement, they want to keep things very simple. They, they don't want to mess around with those other products, Yeah, which I think is like subset of the population, right? Like some people are just right. like, look, simplicity all the way kind of thing. Certainly. How big of a, because you mentioned like high interest savings accounts, how big of a cushion do you think is good? Because obviously there's this opportunity cost, right? Where, okay, every dollar that I'm keeping it, even with a good high interest savings account, every dollar I'm putting in there is now not in equities, which have a higher long-term expected right. return, right? right? And so you're sort of trading off that psychological comfort for some potential money that you may not, that you could have earned. Yeah. Is there any, and I know you're not a big like, rules of thumb guy, but is there anything, you know, like some people will say, oh, well, maybe like two years or because mm-hmm. that, you know, the markets tend to recover over two year periods. You know, do you have any sort of perspectives on when it comes to that in terms of how big to keep the cushion, assuming you don't have like an annuity, assuming you right. don't have these, you know, other insurance products, just some or alternative, like, investments. Or alternative just investments, something that we're all aware of, let's say. Exactly. Something simpler. Because I think because once we start factoring these other things in, that, then the answer becomes, well, it depends, right? And so I'm like, okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah that's right. <laughs> sure. Yeah, you're absolutely so. Sort of practically speaking, you know, what's your yeah. sort of stance? Because, you know, some people will say, oh, no, you should go like very little in your hundred savings account because yeah. opportunity cost. And others will yeah. say, no, 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 you still want something there. So that there's a definitely difference of opinion amongst experts in this industry, yep. for sure. Yep. So I'll tell you, I think a year and a half to two years a cushion is enough. And I'm just looking at my screen right now that you can see as well. The opportunity cost that you're giving up is real, okay? However, I wouldn't want to be taking money out of my investments when I have these kinds of returns, negative returns, two or three years in a row, right? So yes, you're giving up an opportunity cost, but eventually there's going to be a period in your retirement where you are going to have two or three negative years in a row, that's happened. And I can show you many, many times that the words happened, or you've had two years in negative, then one year up and then another year down. When that type of situation arises, if you don't have something very, very safe, or which doesn't you know fluctuate, well, then you're going to be, you're going to fall victim to running out of money. These are real numbers that I'm showing you here. And they were an actual sequence of return over the time. I'm not sure which period of the markets, this happened. But all this to say, don't think of it as opportunity cost. Think of it as this is something in case of emergency. And I'm not talking about an emergency fund. This is something where if the markets did what they did last year, I don't want to go touch money from there now. We need to have something. And so you don't need it now, Cornell, for you, if you're not drawing money from your portfolios. But when we get close to retirement, we really, really, really need to keep the volatility as low as possible while trying to maintain market returns. So I say a year and a half to two years of something safe is should cover you. Sounds good. And that could be something like a hundred savings account, or you could even do like a GIC ladder, I assume. Correct. Yeah. I guess you have to kind of play like, okay, do you want the high interest for the GIC ladder? But then you incur that risk. Okay. Maybe the GIC hasn't matured yet. And you need the money now because we just had a 30% drop. Correct. I could see that. They'll have to decide that for themselves. Yeah. And for that matter, at this point, with the way interest rates are, we have what's called an inverted yield curve where shorter term interest rates are higher than longer term interest rates. So in a situation like this, when we use the latter the GIC strategy, which basically means, let's say you have $100,000, it basically means... Take $20,000 and buy a one, two, three, four, five year GIC for $20,000 each, and there's your lottery. But in a situation like this, I prefer saying, let's not go further than three years, and I have $100,000. Let's put $33,000 in a one year, in a two year, and a three year. And so that's how I would structure a GIC strategy right now. And as a matter of fact, I am looking at a couple of clients where that might be appropriate for them, and we're going to be talking about it next week. So Nice that you brought the GIC laddering strategy also, which is a good strategy when interest rates are higher. 
And when you were talking about this safety cushion of one and a half to two years, I assume that amount would be after you take away dividends you get, after you take away government benefits you get. So like, let's say someone's living off, I don't know, let's say $50,000 a year. So the answer is not, okay, you need 50,000 for year one, plus another like half of that for the half of the second year. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but my typically the when I talk to people about this, the way that you would figure that out is if you spend 50K a year, you don't actually need that 50K per se, because there is somewhat guaranteed, not guaranteed, but some pretty reliable income that you're going to get. Cool. Like you're probably going to get some from dividends, even if there's a drop in the market. Okay, what if they might fall, let's say 25%, but you're still going to get some dividends. Mm-hmm. If you're getting you know, kind of pension plan or old age security, you're probably going to get some of that. In my case, like we're early retirees. So for ours, yeah. we don't have those government pensions, but we get the kind of child benefit, which sort of works in a similar way. In some cases, like in a way, you know, obviously there's some caveats there. So just to clarify, when you talk about this year and a half, two years, I just, I don't want people kind of oversaving and having too much in there yeah, 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 because they're yeah, yeah, yeah. not including things that are relatively reliable, you know, I'm not going to say yes. but relatively reliable that they're going to get. You're absolutely right. And so if I have a client that will be bringing in $40,000 worth of pension, right? Well, then, you know, it's not really needed. But like you said, old age security, Canada pension plan, those are safe sources of retirement income. There's no doubt about it. You know, mm-hmm. you'll have some financial planners or some people in the industry saying, oh, don't depend on the government. You know, you should build something for yourself and not depend on the government. That's garbage. Okay. I've been hearing that since the mid nineties. The Canada pension plan is very, very safe. And as a matter of fact, if things collapse, all they'll do is they'll tell you and I, you have to contribute more now. And they'll tell the employer who also contributes into the Canada, but you have to give up a bit more, and which is what they did, I think, this year. You have to pay a little bit more into the system. So never be concerned. I'm not concerned at all about whether old age security and Canada pension plan will be around. So you'll definitely get those. If you have pension from work, then certainly. And so, no, you don't need that kind of buffer for these types of clients. And that's why, again, every case is different, right? So if I have somebody who's going to be inheriting a million dollars, you know, within the next 10 years, and they know they're going to use that for their retirement, well, then we don't have to be as safe, let's say, you know? And so all circumstances taken into account to determine how much or how, and whether we should or not have like a cushion where we can go get money. Makes sense. Yeah. It sounds like at the end of the day, the main thing is, okay, like when we had the 30% drop in equities, you know, ish, right. Depending on what you're invested in. Yeah. When that happened in the very recent past, to not be at the point where, oh, I have to pay my credit card this month. I'm living off my portfolio. And I guess I have to sell some of those equities, even though they're down 30% because I need to pay the credit card. That's what we're trying to avoid. And that's why you have that extra kind of cushion. But obviously, you wouldn't be in that situation if you're like, oh, well, yeah, they're down, but I've got my old age security coming in. I got my CPP, maybe another pension from work. Plus, I have this extra cash cushion as well. So I'm fine. And so yeah. you're not just mad and sad that you're selling equities after a 30% drop, even though you know, like if you're an index investor like me, like you know that's going to recover eventually. And so I could see that being extremely painful to have to right. do for sure. And anxiety invoking as well because of the sequence of returns risk that you already mentioned. Exactly. So well, let's say we have another negative return this year, which is entirely possible, right? As a matter of I don't make predictions because they're worth nothing. Because there's too many variables out there that'll steer you wrong. So anyone who makes predictions, I really don't like when I see investment firms, for example, on every year, investment firms do, what do they think is going to happen during in the next year? In all of my years in the industry, I've never had one analyst from an investment bank or a, one of these brokerage firms, I've never seen anyone say, we're going to have a bad year this year. And the cool term is cautiously optimistic which came out in 2008, which came out in 2008. And so that's what we get. And so I don't even take predictions with a grain of salt. I just leave predictions out of the picture. But I say, what could happen is we could have two negative years. We could have three negative years. This is a year where it could happen because inflation, recession, potential, whatever the case is, nobody can tell what will happen. So you have to protect yourself you know, for the times when we will have, not if we have, We will have several years of negative returns or two years, then one break even, and then another negative. I can show you histories or points in the in history where that's happened several times. 
and that can really derail you. So you really need to have something in safety. But like you said, I have clients that teachers, for example, Mr. and Mrs. Teacher, they're bringing in $80,000 in pension. We're not doing anything with safety. That's their safety. Right. They have their safety. We're making this money grow for the next 20 years when they're in their 70s. So then I can get very aggressive with that money. And so, as you mentioned, one size fits all doesn't exist. It's all about circumstances of each family or each individual. And have you ever used some type of variable draw strategy with your clients where the amount withdrawn every year to live off the portfolio varies depending on how the markets did that year? Yeah. So certainly, again, that depends on how much guaranteed income is coming in, right, from pensions and what have you. But certainly, I have a client now that we're talking, hey, if we're going to have another bad year, well, you know what? You're not going to take that $10,000 vacation you were hoping for. Let's leave it for a following year. So yes, you have to adapt. And if it means reducing your income, then great. One thing that I like doing is also saying, what's the amount of money that we will need when we are in retirement versus that we want when we're in retirement? So if we can cover our needs, right? Well, then that's the first number that I'm looking at. And so then in years where things are poor, or things are doing poorly, we'll definitely say, let's try to reduce our spending this year. Yes, we have our needs, but we might not you know, go out for supper three times a month, we might take it down to one. So yeah, you have to adapt. There's no doubt about it. Interesting. So when you're working with a client and you're going through, you put all that information into the financial planning software that you use. I like that. You, you have it kind of in two different sort of scenarios where, okay, here's what we actually need. Scenario one, scenario two being, here's what we want. And then when we have like 30% drop type year and someone's heavily into equities and they're going to take a hit, then, okay, you can kind of resort to that other, you know, sort of that, you know, what is the minimum yeah. kind of bucket? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So you do a very much a dynamic sort of plan. And I guess, so what in, when you were talking before about your practice in that kind of a scenario, let's say there was a 30% drop, then you probably I would assume would meet with the client and say, okay, Here's how maybe tweak your lifestyle in the following year yeah. as we wait for the markets to recover. Is that kind of the process that you tend to go with? Yes, it is with certain clients. Now, for most of my clients, we have been able to set up safe buckets, you know, throughout time. And so interesting. Okay. I don't have too much of a problem there. But yeah, I'm thinking of one individual now who retired and all of their money is coming from their investments. And all of their money is in registered investments, okay? So we can also have safety buckets in a registered environment, but many people will unfortunately not have that safety bucket. And so when we don't, when I'm in a situation where a client doesn't have or hasn't been able to develop something and they come to see me now, for example, well, then we're going to have to reduce income needs or income wants if the markets are doing poorly because we haven't really planned 10 years ago that we're going to have this safety bucket, for example. So somebody comes to me without a bucket now, they're a new client. There's no doubt about it that we have to consider reducing our income needs when the markets are doing poorly. Mm -hmm. And so another thing that I can, what I do is, let's say last year we determined that you're going to be getting about $70,000 in income, right? And so we've had one poor year. And at this point, we find ourselves where we are now. Our money is down by 20%. Now I redo the plan and I tell them, well, you know what? Because of what happened, you can only spend 65 now a year or reduce your spending this year and then we can have it increase. But every year I review and renew the plan and it'll show me based on what the values are now and because of the negative 20 or 30% return, this is our attainable retirement income now. Gotcha. You know what? These are the pitfalls of having money in the markets and not having too much more security, meaning pensions or the safety buckets that I talk about. These are the pitfalls of investing. And there's no way we can protect ourselves against that. So just to make sure I understand what you're saying is you don't follow these rules of thumb, like let's say, oh, 4% of fixed amount inflation adjusted or 4% variable withdrawal where, okay, it's 4% of whatever the portfolio is at the time. Mm -hmm. Instead, mm -hmm. it sounds like you take the inputs, you basically update all that into your software? How has the portfolio changed after the market fluctuations? How has the lifestyle changed? And then in the software, then you basically solve for the sustainable scenario. And that becomes the recommendation, you know, for that year or, you know, when you're planning with them. 
did I understand sort of the process absolutely. that you go through? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And okay. I do reviews twice a year. So I'm constantly adjusting plans. For many cases, I'm not because we're not adjusting anything because we do have these safety buckets that we have access Makes to. Makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's rerun the model. Let's retweak everything. When, okay, well, look, we had a brief negative period, but that's why we set up these cash cushions to begin with. Correct. So we're still here. But then I guess if the period is now, let's say it's longer than anticipated and we're mm. starting to run short on that cash cushion, then I imagine then you have that conversation say, okay, absolutely, we're running out now in the cash cushion. So how do we now plan? Do we change lifestyle? Do we get extra income? Did Correct. I understand that correctly in terms of your approach? Okay. I couldn't say it better myself. Absolutely. Awesome. John, when it comes to tax planning and making sure that we're paying the least amount of tax when living off the investment portfolio, are there any strategies or approaches that you'd recommend? Certainly. And as always, it depends on circumstances, but I'll give you some ideas that may be useful. If we're in retirement and we have no income coming in, we're, we're 60 and we figured John told me that we should take Canada Pension Plan and old age security at age 70, let's say, okay? And let's say that's a good, but so now for 10 years, you have all these investments and you might have money in your RSPs. You probably do have money in your RSPs. So one strategy is to start withdrawing earlier than you need or than you have to from your RSPs. So again, I have a couple where they're not earning any income right now. So basically what we're doing is we're taking about $20,000 a year out of each of their RSPs where they're not paying taxes, right? And so that's an appropriate tax planning strategy. When I do a financial plan, there's one particular section which shows me vividly, like very, very clear, whether RRSPs are a good idea or not. RRSPs are a great idea for, I'd say, 80% of the population. For the rest, it isn't. I can tell you stories where clients come to retirement, they've accumulated a lot of money, and a lot of that money is in RSPs. And when they reach the age of 72, when they have to start withdrawing, they have enough money to live off, but the government is still telling them, well, you know what? You have to take out 80,000 from your RSPs and we'll take half of it. So this is why I say tax planning strategy. Let's determine if RSPs are appropriate. When I have somebody or a family that has two pension plans in place, it's likely RSPs may not be appropriate. And so that's a tax planning strategy. Obviously, the types of investments you have you know, play a role if you have money outside of RSPs and TFSAs. So you know, typical dividend-paying stocks, you're better off earning dividend than interest. So it depends on the types of assets that you have. It depends on... Again, whether you have, you're have you going to have a reliable income or not in the future, it'll give us ideas of what to do when it comes to tax planning. But the one point that I've been making to many people, and they're all like, really? Well, why was I investing in RSPs then? To that 15 or 20% of the people, that's one of the biggest tax planning strategies. And like I said, my software will show exactly whether RSPs are appropriate or not. And it's, it's so clear because the, uh, somebody might find themselves in a higher tax bracket during retirement. And that's why RSPs might not be a good idea. So like I said, mostly it's a, it's right, but not in all cases. Yeah, it's very situational and you have to have it modeled out because yeah, look at it as this puzzle you have to solve when you're approaching that age because, okay, you're going to have CPP coming in, you're going to have OAS coming in. You've probably got a bunch of your RSPs. You may have a work pension as well. And so how do we take out income from those at the right time and the right amounts Right. pay the least amount of tax. And that is very much something you have to model out to actually see, okay, at the end of the day, how much tax did I pay for this? And was there a better sort of way to withdraw it from these different buckets? So Correct. I hear you. So that's something that you do in your job, I imagine a lot, right? All the time. Yeah. Yeah. Because again, I get all sorts of clients. And one, a very good example is business owners because they've accumulated money in their corporation. Yes. They might have a million or $2 million or something like that. And they have a million dollars in their RSPs as well. Well, they're going to get hit in their 70s. And I've had people, as I mentioned before, why were they telling me to do RSPs? Well, that's what banks do. Or most advisors, they get paid on commission. They have objectives to reach certain RSP targets. So nobody really goes through the exercise to determine if RSPs are appropriate. Everybody feels 
that they can get away with, yeah, maximize your RSP. And I'm saying, man, that's so wrong. In many cases, that's so wrong. I've had clients say, is TFSA better or RSPs? And the question comes to is, depending on, you know, TFSA will give you more flexibility because you won't necessarily have that money only for retirement. You can have it for other needs that may arise in the future or other wants that may arise in the future. And so if the tax planning shows that, let's say, TFSAs and RSPs would be equal, then I'd certainly tell people, do TFSAs. Right. A lot more flexible. Because you'll have more flexibility. Yeah. Like you can contribute back to it if you take it out, as long as you follow the rules, whereas you pretty much lose it forever with the RSP. So yeah, there's all these different... I hear you. Yeah. (laughs) Mm. I enjoy the the flexibility of the TFSA with the RSP. It's like, oh, you bet. They're going to take a bunch out right off the bat. And then you got to factor into your tax. It's a whole... Yeah. And you know what, Cornell, for the RSP, I can show you calculators with this. This is pure numbers games now. For the RSP strategy to work for you, you need to invest the return of tax that you get yes. back into your savings. And what do most people do? We spend it. Yeah. It's like a bonus paycheck. And then, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So it's like, if you're going to do that, you would have been better off doing TFSA. Most likely, I can right? show you a video that outlines that clearly, that if you do your RSP and you invest the tax return, then it tends to work. Not for everybody, but for most people, mm-hmm. it tends to work. But it hurts when we're spending that return. The theory is we're going to put that money in RSP. That's what makes RSP the RSP strategy work for 80% of people. Awesome. John, I was going to ask you, for my next question about some of the resources that you recommend, I'm sure there's certain go-to places that you like to go just to stay informed about any sort of changes in taxes or any you know financial planning strategies, things of that nature. But maybe yeah, before we dive into that, I did want to give you a shout out again, just for anybody, we've been talking for a while, for anybody that is interested in speaking with you. And again, thanks for offering to answer questions that people have. So even if they're not to come on board, and have dedicated financial planner per se, I appreciate you at least offering to be able to answer questions that they may have. So again, the page that we built for John, just to make this process easier, is buildwealthcanada.ca slash John. So you can go there and then basically John will get an email once you fill, basically you enter your email and then John will get that email. And then that way you guys can sort of arrange a time to chat, that kind of a thing to get your questions answered. So thanks again, John, for doing that. And you know, with that said, you know, obviously apart from people being able to use you as a resource and as a source of getting their questions answered. Are there any other websites or just resources that you'd recommend for those DIY people like myself who like to be informed, be in the loop? Because there's definitely an abundance of information. Unfortunately, a lot of it is garbage. (laughs) And And it's part of your job to be able to decide what is the garbage and what is not. Can you tell us where the quality sources of information are? particularly for people like myself who just like to geek out and read about these things for fun and learn. You know, what I've done over the years is whenever I find something that's interesting at any given site, I sort of bookmark it. And I have, so I have all of my resources are basically things that I've seen over the past 20 years. Is there one particular website or, you know, the Financial Planning Standards of Canada is a great website to inform yourself about what financial planning is and what you need to do. And they give you a very clear outline. And it's a non-biased source of information. Uh, They're not making any money if you buy stocks or bonds or, you know, so that's a great way to use. That's a great site to look at. So you can get non-biased. The most important thing that I'll bring up is find sites that are not biased. I use as far as inflation is concerned, for example, the Financial Planning Standards of Canada, they have actuaries that will determine or that they'll predict what kind of inflation rate we should use. And so that's a, a great source. The Canada Pension Plan estimates I'm obviously using, right, for anyone who's not in retirement. So there's another site. But do I have a go-to site where I'm always using? And for me, the answer is no, because 30 years... I'm really involved in the industry. So anytime I see anything interesting, when I'm surfing the web, for example, I sort of take it and I keep it. And so I can't really tell you that here's one, two, three sites to go check everything out. Just if you want more information on ETFs, just Google the term ETFs, and you're going to be able to determine which are the appropriate sites and which aren't. But like you said, there's a lot of confusion out there. There's lots of contradictions out there. So what I would tell you, maybe the best tip to give you is if you're looking for 
advice on investments, try not to find a broker or an investment advisor. Find someone more neutral, a financial planner who does only financial planning for clients, for example. I can't tell you that there's one or two particular sites that I enjoy going to. I'm just kept up to date all the time because I have everything open all the time in my industry. So I'm nothing particular that I think I can recommend for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you mentioned the Financial Planning Standards Council. I think that's a really good, definitely a good resource because like you said, they are not biased. They're not saying one thing and then, oh, I now buy our ETFs or now buy our <laughs> stocks or buy our mutual fund. Because their job, from my understanding, is to support you, the financial planners, and make sure that you have all the things you need to be able to do your job effectively, right? Correct. And to provide advice for consumers. That's their biggest mandate. Oh, okay. Interesting. And so, yeah, yeah, there's a whole bunch of other associations for financial planners, but the Financial Planning Standards of Canada is mostly for consumers. And there's a lot of information there. You're not going to get detailed information about you know investment strategies, but you'll get the general guidelines of what someone needs to do to create an appropriate financial plan. Gotcha. And also, it's a good, I guess, source of quality control where if you're working with a financial planner or you're considering working with one, you can see what the Financial Standards Council recommends that they should be looking at and see what this financial planner is telling you. And those right. should be pretty similar. If they're saying, hey, you should also touch on estate planning and they don't even touch on estate planning, then it's like, okay, that's right. a flag. Why are they not doing a holistic financial plan with me? You know what I mean? Maybe they say it's holistic, but maybe it's not. Maybe they're missing some key elements. And so that yeah. can be a nice red flag that, okay, maybe this person isn't what I'm looking for. Remember, estate planning doesn't pay commission to advisors. Reviewing financial plans don't pay commission. And unfortunately, the bottom line is the huge majority of the industry advisors get paid on commission. So I'm not saying everybody's bad. I'm just saying that there's potential conflict of interest. And so you want to try to find non-biased advice. And like you said, there are all these other spokes. Financial planning is a wheel and there's a lot of spokes. There's a whole bunch of spokes that are not commission oriented. Like you said, estate planning, tax planning, preparation of your will. There's no gain to be made for somebody. Nobody's going to sell you anything. And so a lot of advisors don't have that on their menu. But these are important topics, you know, like especially if you're going to be leaving sizable amounts of money to your children. Well, man, there's different ways of transferring that money from one generation to another. And so you're not going to get too much advice from the typical advisor out there. I'm not saying everybody, obviously, and I was a broker in the 90s, and I met lots of fabulous brokers, and I met others who were not as fabulous. So just keep that in mind, even when you're doing research on the internet. If an insurance agent is writing an article in the Financial Post, well, it's an insurance agent. Of course, he's going to say insurance strategies are appropriate for you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. When clients ask me for, do you have any information on what I've, what I've told them about? And I say, yes. And as a matter of fact, the information that I have for clients that I've collected, again, over the years is all non-biased advice coming from areas where there's no you know, commission interest, let's say. Gotcha. And John, just to finish things off here, you've been a financial planner for decades at this point, like we've talked about. And I'm sure with that level of experience over the years, you've noticed certain patterns when it comes to clients that are successful financially and also life in general versus mm -hmm. those that are not. Can you give us any insights in terms of the best practices or patterns that you've noticed from those that are financially successful and also appear to be happy and fulfilled in their day-to-day -day life as well? Right. You know what key element I think of retirement planning is underestimate your numbers. When I do retirement planning, in many cases, I'll use a rate of return of 5%. And I'll have clients mention, when we're having great years, they're saying 5%, really, only, John? I'm not shooting for 5%, but for the plan's purpose, if we want to foolproof it, let's underestimate what we think we're going to earn. Now, when I'm telling clients 5 or 6% in 2022, they tend to say, really, that much, you know, with these markets? So when we're having good years, 5% is not enough. When we're having bad years, 5% is too much. All this to say... I make it a point to underestimate rates of return. I make it a point to overestimate inflation by a bit. So the financial planning standards, I believe this year they're saying 2.25% is a proper number of inflation. I like using 250 or 275. 
you'd be surprised what a quarter of a percent inflation does over 30 or 40 years. So I like underestimating numbers. And when someone tells me $60,000 sounds right, I'll tell them, you know what, add another 10% for all these unexpected slaps that you're going to get in the face every year from expenses that you didn't know were there. So these are the types of things that I like to put in place. And doing that, we're setting ourselves up for success. If we're estimating that you're only going to return, you know, get a rate of return of 6% or 5%, and we're not using 8 or 9 which is totally ridiculous, and these are numbers that people are still using, it'll tend to make you save a little bit more so you can reach the goal. So that's how you're able to have cushions of security as well. Underestimate what you think you're going to earn. Keep that in your plan. Review the plan every year if life changes, okay? And for many people, life does change. And so these are, I think, what I've noticed. And now, one, living a happy life, what I can tell you is money, we've all heard this, right? Some people will say money doesn't contribute to happiness. It's not the money. You know what? It's not the money. What I think money allows you to do is for you to give more of who you are. So let's say, for example, you give money to charity. Well, you know what? If you build a lot of money, you'll probably be giving more money to charity. It allows you to magnify the type of personality you have. If you're the type that loves cars and all of a sudden you have a lot of money, now you're going to get nicer cars or big, you know, more expensive cars. I'm saying money itself is not going to make you more happy. It's just going to magnify whatever your personality is right now. How do you stay happy? That's a good question. I'm not a philosopher. So all I can say is let's determine how much money or let's see which way you're headed based on what you're doing right now. And then we can determine if that's enough or not and what needs to be done to increase it or, you know, whether you're saving too much. What's made my clients happy and happy in life is that they're able to fulfill whatever goals they had before they retire. Well, I'll give you an example, which still brings me shivers when I think about it, of one particular client who was having a hard time at work and her husband is a business owner and they had zero clue where they're headed. And to make a long story short, at the end of the analysis, I mentioned to her, you know what, you don't need to stress yourself out like this at work. As a, You don't need that kind of money. You already have enough. Basically, I gave them the idea that they have enough money. And with her husband still working in her business, she can stop working if she wanted to, if it's, you know, tearing her apart. And she told me on the phone, John, you made me feel so good. And then I get an email saying, you changed my life in one day. And man, what an, so I'm saying, what an impact that was. Just letting her know that work if you want to, you don't have to at this point. And so that's, you know, financial planning, if done properly, provides clarity. And that's what keeps people sleeping at night. They know how much they need to save. They know if markets go down, it's no big deal. Clarity, I think, is the most important thing that I deliver for clients. Mm-hmm. that keeps people, you know, confident and happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Something like that's completely life-changing. If you're just, your default is, oh, I just have to keep working and it turns out you don't and you hate your job. I mean, yeah, I could see that yeah. being completely, completely life-changing and just for yeah. mental health as well. And probably improve the family life as well, because now one of the partners is not stressed, upset, unhappy all the time. Correct. They, they get to actually focus on living a fulfilling life, doing something they enjoy. I imagine that's going to be one of the most rewarding things in your job. <laughs> you bet, you bet. And this person is a nurse, so okay. we can understand. Yeah, and your wife's a nurse, so yeah, you can. <laughs> Excuse me. My wife's a nurse, and she comes home with stories all the time, mm-hmm. bad stories about short staff, about mandatory overtime and stuff like that. It's so tough. And so when I'm able to give news like that to people, it really, really makes my day. I mean, like I was choked when I was reading her email. So that's one way, I guess, to be happy is to know what's coming up, Ex- you know, expect what's coming up and then obviously be prepared for it. Awesome. I have people that are telling me, and these are friends usually, especially again in 2022. And they tell me, man, your phone must be off the hook. The markets are getting creamed. The NASDAQ is down 40%, whatever. And honestly, Cornell, I told you I had one client that reached out to me to say, I'm concerned. No other client has reached out like that. Nobody, nobody, nobody. And the reason is I've set them up a long time ago that this is going to happen. And in many cases, when we review the plan, 
with all the new numbers, their attainable retirement amount has gone down, not significantly, not significantly. So one bad year is not going to do a lot of damage. And so providing that clarity again to clients is what keeps people happy. I'm talking to clients now that are already retired, and we're thinking of putting a GIC strategy in place. It keeps them happy to have reviews and to know that things are sort of, you know, are working. And if they're not working, what do we need to do to make it work? Do we need to reduce our living standards? That might be the case. If we can provide clarity in someone's retirement on a regular basis, it keeps people happy. For sure. Well, yeah, like the anxiety reduction alone, right, is, is worth it, I would say. You can live your life instead of worrying about money or, or working, doing something you don't enjoy just because of the fear. So to not have that fear, it's great. I don't think there's anything worse than, than anxiety. Mm-hmm. Anxiety is fear. I'm stressed out means I'm afraid. I'm stressed out. Why are you stressed out? Because I have so much work. Why? I don't think I'll be able to get it done. Stress is just another word of saying anxiety, fear. If you can eliminate that from someone's Oh, it's life-changing. You know, from some forms financial area of their lives, then, you know, that's when a planner is, you know, really doing their job. Mm-hmm. Awesome. All right, John. Well, yeah, thanks so much for sharing your, your expertise with us. Learned from you as well. Can you tell us more? Where can we see your work? And yeah, tell us more a little bit about your practice for anybody interested. Sure. So I'm associated with a firm called Iron Shield Financial Planning. We are all independent financial planners. So you can check out my profile and what I've done, and you can see my blog that I have some good articles there at ironshield.com. And so that's what I like about this team that we have is we're all sort of on the same, we're all, I would say, equal. In other words, we do, we have a process that we follow and we all do it like that. And so if I get hit by a bus and I can't work anymore, I know that there's going to be continuation for the client. You're not going to go to someone different with different strategies or, you know, turn things upside down. That's why I enjoy being with Iron Show Financial Planning. We're all independent. We all do our own thing, but we all follow a specific model that we all agree is the best way to do things for our clients. So I have my podcast, right, which I haven't done any episodes in a very long time. I just don't have time. But that's confessions of an ex-banker, right? One thing we did not mention, or did we, that I spent... Up until 2015, I was in the banking industry. And so I came out with the confessions of an ex-banker when I left the industry. One of the main reasons why I did that type of podcast was for me to burn my bridges with the banking industry. (laughs) Once I did that podcast, I'm done. I'm cooked when it comes to going back and knocking on their doors for a job. I'm finished, right? There's a lot of people that don't like me out there. And I've gotten comments from ex-colleagues in the bank. But the only reason I did it was really, first of all, let's bring out the truth, you know, to what's happening out there. But also, you know, from a selfish point of view, I knew if I do this, I'm done. I I can never go back. So it's either sink or swim. You know, I I have to survive. And thankfully, I did. But that's where you can find some of my philosophies through Confessions of an Ex-Banker. And obviously, the podcast, we've done several podcasts now. I, I think we're always saying at the end of the podcast, I think we're really delivering value. And going back to one question, and maybe we'll make this as a final point. We, you mentioned what sources you know are available out there. What do you do? Your source is a good source for advice. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> right? I'm not kidding. With the I wasn't fishing for that when I asked that question. Oh, no, you weren't. You. <laughs> and I thought I was going to get a laugh from you. But truly, especially for people where exchange-traded funds are the best, and that is for most people okay, uh, that are not you know close to retirement, then my goodness, you have all the resources on your website and your course that you have when it comes to exchange traded funds. That's a great place not only to start. If someone is doing exchange traded funds and they feel they can do it on their own with your course, they're only going to be a lot much better. And so I wanted to mention that as well because because I've had comments. People have you know we've uh, I've had many people contact me right from the podcast, and they all tell me how much they value your advice and and the course that you offer, which is your offering, as far as I'm concerned, for peanuts. And so there you go. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for that endorsement, John. I wasn't expecting that. So (laughs) (laughs) thanks thanks as well. Yeah. I mean, since you brought it up, yeah, check out the past episodes that we did. I hope hope everybody enjoyed this episode. The course, if anybody does want to check it out, it's buildwealthcanada.ca slash invest. So if you go there, you'll see the course page. And basically it's, it's how my wife and I invest. And before we were French independent, that's how we did it. And that's how we're still doing it now. And I keep updating it as well as people ask questions and things like that. So it's up to date. 
so yeah, buildwithcanada.ca slash invest. And, and again, a big thank you uh, to you, John, for coming out and sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, again, for anybody that does want to ask John some questions or maybe learn more about his practice or you know maybe see if John's a good fit for them, the page we made to make it easy for you to sign up is buildwealthcanada.ca slash John. So if you go there, you can pretty much do that. And, and again, John, I appreciate you putting yourself out there, not just for all oh, contact me you know if you want to be maybe a potential client yeah, instead yeah, you're yeah, saying yeah. well yeah we can do that but also if you have questions to make your that you're making yourself available like because obviously you have clients like a lot of clients and you're a busy guy so very generous of you to say look even if you're not ready to you know, like sign on or you're not actively looking for a financial planner yet at the very least you can get some questions answered you know with no sort of catch or anything like that so absolutely thank you that's a really generous service because like i said I, I get like more questions than i can handle and so it's nice to have someone here that can help me out <laughs> that, that's yeah, reputable yeah, yeah. that's been in the industry for decades and can help answer questions and it's always nice to get a second opinion on things as well right so so even if you know you think you know something it doesn't hurt to get a second opinion either Correct. because because yeah like, like as you've mentioned many times now there isn't this like cut and dry where x is always the correct answer okay. so many things are situational and so it's nice to learn these caveats and yeah, learn yeah. which one fits with your particular situation and then that's what you end up implementing so again john thanks for your time and, and this is fun uh, fun as always I'm, I'm glad we did this it's always a pleasure cornell awesome <laughs> all, all right. right john until next time thanks a lot all right take care bye All right, a big thanks to John for coming on. Also, I really hope to see you at the live free webinar that I'll be doing this month with the co-creator of the TFSA, Kevin McCarthy. It'll be really nice to actually interact with you, help you where I can. And of course, Kevin is an enormous wealth of knowledge when it comes to all this. So it's a great spot to learn. Ask him your questions as well. The RSP and TFSA presentation and live Q&A will be on February the 23rd at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And even if you can't make it live, be sure to sign up so that we know where to send you the recording of the entire session once it's released. The link to sign up for the free live session or just to get the recording when it's ready is over at buildwealthcanada.ca slash webinar. That's buildwealthcanada.ca slash webinar. And now I'd like to give a big thank you to our two sponsors that not only help keep the lights on, but also apart from my investing course, help keep everything on the Build Wealth Canada podcast and site free for you. Our first sponsor is BMO ETFs. Do you know why asset allocation ETFs have become so popular? Asset allocation explains over 90% of the variation in a portfolio's quarterly returns. So it's no wonder Canadian investors are turning to these ETFs. Today's sponsor, BMO ETFs, offers these innovative all-in-one solutions with the BMO All Equity ETF, ZEQT, BMO Growth ETF, ZGRO, BMO Balanced ETF, ZBAL, BMO Conservative ETF, ZCON, and more. BMO developed these to help provide investors with ETFs that offer broad diversification and they're also low-cost and simple to use. These ETFs invest in a number of underlying index-based ETFs and are rebalanced automatically back to your set asset allocation or mix of stocks and bonds. They offer a hands-free approach to investing that is built on disciplined weights to provide exposure to different geographies and sectors all in one solution. BMO actually offers eight asset allocation ETFs and you can learn more at BMOETFs.com. I'd also like to thank Passive, the investing tool that I use for my entire investment portfolio. You can get your free account and passive over at buildwealthcanada.ca slash free. And you can see my portfolio and what ETFs I buy with in passive over at buildwealthcanada.ca slash portfolio. Passive is literally the number one tool that I consistently use to manage all my investments as it lets me immediately see what I'm holding too much and too little of in my portfolio and then automatically calculates how much I need to buy of each ETF to get me back to my target asset allocation across all my household's accounts. Then if I want in a couple of clicks, I can have passive buy the investments that I'm holding too little of across all my and my wife's accounts without me having to log in and out of each account to manually do the trades myself. My other favorite feature is to be able to see the performance of my entire household's investment portfolio across all our accounts in just a mouse click instead of manually having to add everything up across all our accounts just to see how we're doing. 
They have a free account that you can use to try them out. And if you are a Quest Trade user like me, you can also get their premium account for free. So it's a complete no brainer. And I've personally been using them for years at this point. So I can definitely vouch for them as they have literally become my number one favorite tool for managing my investments as they've saved me dozens of hours when managing and optimizing my investment portfolio. Definitely check them out. They are a fantastic Canadian company and you can get your free account by going to build wealthcanada.ca slash free. Again, that's buildwealthcanada.ca slash free. Thanks for listening to the Build Wealth Canada podcast at www.buildwealthcanada.ca. 